So hello and welcome to this unpredictable course entitled Feminist Writings. We've just finished reading uh, Catherine Mansell's short story, The Fly. So in this lecture today, we'll start with a news story by D.H. Lawrence. This is called Tickets, Please. Now, before we move into the story, we'll do what we always do. We try to give up context to the story. We talk about um, the setting, the historical setting of the story, and why is it important for us to be mindful of the setting. Now, you, you see that the, we should be on the screen at the moment, but at the very beginning, we see that a year of publication is mentioned. Um, uh, it's 1919. Now, 1919, of course, is a very important date because what it tells us immediately from a historical perspective is that it's immediately after the First World War. So 1914 to 18 was the First World War, and this is 1919. So it inhabits uh, more or less the same historical time as Captain Mansfield's The Fly, which was written in 1922. Uh, so, you know, again, we have the same kind of historical setting, the same kind of uh, demography in operation, uh, you know, which is described over here. So, and both Mansfield's Fly and uh, Lawrence's story, Tickets, Please, uh, they talk about, I mean, th this is about Europe, this is about the uh, white Western world, uh, and how uh, the white Western world gets uh, depicted in a post-war setting. Now, I think I may have mentioned this already uh, during my lectures on Mansfield's Fly, and that is, if we look at the demography of Europe after the First World War, we find that there's a significant shift uh, in terms of, uh, you know, the number of men and number of women, uh, because a large part of the young male population in, in Europe, at least, uh, got, you know, wiped off uh, in the war because of uh, the, the immense amount of uh, human causality which happened uh, in the war. And of those men who got left behind, those men who did not die, uh, a large section of those men uh, became injured, became uh, paralyzed, became, uh, you know, had conditions, physical conditions, which would not enable them, which would not allow them uh, to take up, you know, really important uh, and physically demanding positions. Now, what that did, um, essentially, uh, from a demographic uh, perspective, is it, it opened up lots of jobs for women which were hitherto, uh, you know, forbidden for them. So, obviously, we, we, we historically speaking, we started seeing women uh, work as, uh, you know, uh, post officers, delivering posts, women uh, working as uh, tram conductors, which is a case um, in this particular story, women working, I mean, they are entering, we see women uh, increasingly enter the public domain, the public space, uh, the professional public space, which was hitherto uh, forbidden to them, uh, not allowed to them. Uh, didn't have access to the space uh, before. Uh, so this particular story by Lawrence is about uh, some tram conductors, ticket collectors walking in, in trams in a certain route. And we find there's a you know, description of women tram conductors. And of, in, in a group of women tram conductors, there happens to be one man. Uh, and what happens uh, in that kind of a setting, in that kind of a demography condition? And it's a story which is very typical of Lawrence. I mean, if you read any of other Lawrence's works, I mean, the longer works that he's published, um, you know, some more famous novels, The Sons and Lovers, uh, The Rainbow, uh, Lady Chatterley's Lover, which is again, obviously very infamous, it was banned for a long period of time because of obscenity. But one of the recurring, um, one of the recursive markers in his writings and a level of style is a depiction of the sensory experience, the, you know, the, the sensual, the sensuous, the sensory experience. Uh, so experientiality becomes a very important um, condition, very important uh, uh, quality in Lawrence's writing. I mean, how does he you know, describe or represent experience, whether it's uh, a very deep-seated physical sensory experience, and how does it connect to a broader narrative, uh, which is cultural inequality, which is social inequality, which is political inequality. So, and the whole idea, the whole tension between landscapes and, and cityscape, the whole tension between the urban life and the rural life, these are depicted uh, through certain human episodes which are very sensory in quality. So, uh, the, the sensory quality, the, the sentient quality is something that Lawrence really excels in as a writer. And it's one of his uh, hallmarks as a writer, as, as a great stylist in fiction. Now, uh, we just start with the story and we find that uh, one, of the, one of the conditions, one of the qualities in Lawrence's writing is a very graphic quality about his descriptions, whether it's human descriptions about you know, human relationships, whether it's emotional descriptions about emotional entanglements, uh, physical relationships, uh, you know, landscapes, you know, social conditions, political conditions, they all are described very graphically in Lawrence's writings, which is something which uh, is a bit of a hallmark in his style.
So let's dive into the story and let's see how it's important for us in uh, you know, this particular course in feminist writings. So this is Tickets, Please by D.H. Lawrence. There is in the North a single line system of tram cars which boldly leaves a country town and plunges off into the black industrial countryside, uphill and down dale, to the long ugly villages in workmen's houses, over canals and railways, past churches perched high and nobly over the smoke and shadows through dark, grimy, cold little marketplaces, tilting away in a rush past cinemas and shops down to the hollow where the collieries are, collieries are, then up again past a little rural church under the ash trees or in a bolt to the terminus, the last little ugly place of the industry, the cold little down that shivers on the edge of the world, wild, gloomy country beyond. So we have this sort of meandering description of a, a tram car moving. So, and again, this is the quality of a really powerful writer because what is being told to us superficially is the route of a particular tram, a particular tram car. But then what is actually been told to us is the quality of the landscape. And we see the word uh, industrial keeps coming up uh, in the description over here. And obviously the historical setting, the, the, the geographical setting, of Lawrence's writings mostly is Northern England, uh, which used to be a big thing for you know, the, the collieries and, and it's mention of the collieries over there, the coal mines uh, and the industries around the coal uh, production, etc. So that, that was the historical setting in Yorkshire. Uh, the northern part of England was uh, something that Lawrence wrote about quite um, so consistently. But you know, what gets depicted immediately in the, in the beginning of the story is how the industrial quality of the landscape is ugly, is dark, is grimy, is not something which is uh, beautiful and pristine. Now, we have little pockets of pristineness uh, every now and then. Uh, and this, this tension between the pristine, rural quality of the landscape and the non-pristine, dark, grimy, uh, industrial quality of the landscape is something which keeps you know, happening, keeps coming back in Lawrence's writings. So uh, that's something which is palpable uh, or palpably present at the very beginning of the story. That the blue and creamy colored tram car seems to pause and purr with curious satisfaction. But in a few minutes, uh, the clock in the turret of the cooperative wholesale society's shops gives the time. Away it starts once more on the adventure. So, you know, the tram car seems to be, seems to have been humanized away here. So you know, the tram car is breathing, it's stopping, uh, it's purring. Uh, and it's almost like it's going out on an adventure and it's across the landscape. Again, there are the reckless swoops downhill, bouncing the loops, again the chilly weight and the hilltop marketplace, again the breathless slithering around the precipitous drop under the church, again the patient holes of the loops waiting for the outcoming car, so on and on, for two long hours, till at least at last the city looms beyond. The, the far to gas works, the narrow factories draw near. We are in the solid streets of the great town. Once more we sidle to a standstill at a terminus, abashed by the great crimson and cream-colored city cars, but still jerky, jaunty, somewhat dare devil, paired as a blue tit out of a black colliery garden. So uh, the whole idea of the tram car entering the city becomes a very visual description. And the city is obviously very jazzy. There are lots of colorful cars. Uh, it's, uh, there's a lot more velocity in the city and, and there's a degree of incompatibility between the tram car and the city and hence the word jerky uh, is important uh, and it's a bit of an outsider, it's a bit of an intruder uh, into the functioning machinery of the city but it still comes in uh, every day as some kind of a ritual movement. To ride on those cars is always an adventure. The drivers are often men unfit for active services, cripples and hunchbacks and this is what I was meaning at the beginning of the story when I said, you know, a large amount of the male population, large section of the male population post First World War were essentially crippled uh, by the war. They, they crippled by the violence of the war. Either they may have been soldiers who fought in the trenches, but they came back injured uh, beyond redemption, beyond um, healing. So they had to look for services uh, such as uh, driving tram cars, cripples and hunchbacks. So they have the spirit of the devil in them. The ride becomes a, a steeplechase. Hooray! We have leapt in the clean jump over the canal bridges, now for a four-lane corner. With a shriek and a trail of sparks, we are clear again. To be sure, uh, a tram often leaps the rails, but what matter? It sits in a ditch until other trams come to haul it out. It is quite common for a car packed with one sorted mass of living people to come to a dead halt in the midst of an unbroken blackness. 
the heart of nowhere on the dark night and for a driver and a girl conductor to call all get off cars on fire instead of rushing out in a panic the passengers stolidly reply get on get on we're not coming out we're not we're stopping where we are push on george so till flames actually appear now there's a comical quality about this particular description so what has been said to us it's very common for tram cars to catch fire uh, and for people who sit inside the tram cars they couldn't care less at the beginning and the girl conductor urges them to leave the tram car I and mean, she shrieks she screams at them asking them to get off the tram but they're so sort of solidly and very straightly sitting in the tram car until they actually see the flames and then they walk out uh, in a very, very lazy fashion till the flames actually appear they wouldn't move they wouldn't uh, budge they actually ask the people to get off the driver and the, uh, the conductor to get off and push the car the reason for this reluctance to dismount is that the nights are howlingly cold black and windswept and a car is a heaven of refuge so the car the tram car uh, uh, along with being a means of communication, a means of transport, also becomes a very warm shelter uh, in the very cold, um, black and dreary, windswept nights. And that's a very important uh, piece of information given to us. I mean, it, we are also told uh, the, 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 the climate, the weather of the place, and how the weather becomes uh, quite hostile and inclement in quality. From village to village, the miners travel. So this is the demography we're looking at, the mining population, the miners in the northern bit of England, uh, who are essentially the people who take, take the tram cars uh, in, across the villages. From village to village, the miners travel for a change of cinema, of girl, of pub. So the different distractions available, uh, someone is going to watch a film in the cinema, someone is probably having an affair with a girl, or someone is going to a pub to get drunk. So the, the different distractions, the different um, forms of uh, activities, um, amorous activities and alcoholic activities and you know, uh, watching a film. Uh, so we're talking about uh, miners, uh, so presumably they're not very quote unquote sophisticated people, they're not very urban people. So for them, a diversion, uh, you know, having a diversion, having uh, some kind of entertainment is only limited to a few options. And of course, it's quite crude uh, and, and it's quite um, sort of quote unquote working class and quality. And that's something which you need to bear in mind because Lawrence uh, he himself came from a coal miners family and so he essentially had a very working class background. So uh, we find in most occasions he, he writes about the working class coal mining families in the northern bit of England. Uh, that's the setting, that's the demography he understands best as a writer and he describes best as a writer. So that, that becomes his key, uh, the, the key crowd in his novels. The trams are desperately packed. Who is going to risk himself in the black gulf outside? To wait perhaps an hour for another tram, then to see full on notice depe only because there's nothing wrong, something wrong or to greet a unit of three bright cars all so tight with people that a sail pass with a howl of derision, trams that pass in the night. So the different kinds of trams which pass in the night, some of the trams are dysfunctional, uh, so they have this um, notice called depot only written, which means they're heading for the depot, they're not going anywhere else, uh, or um, uh, some of the trams are so bright, uh, so, so packed with people that they just sail pass without stopping with a howl of derision. Uh, so, you know, people tend to get in the tram cars as quick as they can because uh, it's very cold and very dark and it's great hostile outside in terms of the weather. So trams offer some kind of a, a heaven, a warm heaven. This, the most dangerous tram service in England, as authorities themselves declare with pride, is entirely conducted by girls. And this is where it gets um, you know, interesting from a demographic perspective. This is the most dangerous uh, tram service in England as is classified by the uh, central authorities themselves and we find we are, we are told that this entire route, this entire tram service is entirely conducted by girls, right? And that's important for us to understand. And driven by rash young men or else by invalids who creep forward in terror. The girls are fearless young hussies. Uh, so if you look at the vocabulary of Lawrence, some of the words which he uses uh, are perhaps inappropriate uh, from a modern perspective. But then he was writing a, 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 from a particular point of time, from a particular vocabulary, from a particular culture, and you know, a, a particular sort of level, a location and culture. So as I mentioned, this is a very working class uh, kind of writing, very working class language uh, that he's using deliberately in order to talk about these people and the kind of vocabulary they use while talking to each other. In the ugly blue uniforms, skirts up to the knees, shapeless old pig caps on the heads, they have all this sang-froid of an old commissioned officer, non-commissioned officer, 
with the tram packed with howling colliers, roaring hymns downstairs, and a sort of antiphony of obscenities upstairs, the lasses are perfectly at their ease. So, you know, this is not something which we uh, would normally associate with a ladylike condition, ladylike situation, because there are people who are presumably drunk, they're swearing at each other, sometimes they're violent with each other, uh, and the, the whole tram car is packed with these howling colliers, very working class, uh, violent people. But these women who are conducting the tram cars, who are the conductors in the tram cars, they seem to be perfectly at ease in terms of being there and getting the job done. Uh, the pounds on the youths who try to evade the ticket machine. So they're very, very uh, aggressive, they're very, very keen, they're very observant. Uh, they, they, we can't escape their, their attention. We can't sort of get out of the tram car without paying the tickets. The push of the men at the end of the distance. They're not going to be done in the eye, not they. But they fear nobody and everybody fears them. So and if you're buying a ticket uh, for a particular destination and if you're exceeding the destination, they would remember uh, each one of us, each one of the passengers, and they would push off the passengers um, at the destination uh, that are paid for until the paid form. So they are very, very vigilant, very aggressive, very uh, vigorous in the, in the jobs. And we're told they fear nobody and everybody fears them. So they, they have this fear factor about them. And that's something which we are uh, told quite at the beginning of the story. And now we have a conversation between the woman over here. Hello Annie, hello Ted, on oh, mine my corn, my stone, it's my belief you've got a heart of stone for you've trotted it again. You should keep it in the pocket, replies Miss Stone, and she goes sturdily upstairs in her high boots. Tickets please. She's peremptory, suspicious and ready to hit first. She can hold her own against 10,000. Therefore there is a certain wild romance aboard those cars uh, and a sturdy bosom of Annie herself. The romantic time is in the morning between 10 o'clock and 1 when things are rather slack, that is, except market day and Saturday. Then Annie has time to look about her. Then she often hops off a car and into the shop where she has spied something while her driver chats on the main road. There's, some, there's a very good feeling between the girls and the drivers. Uh, are they not companions in peril, shipmates aboard this careering vessel of a tram car, forever rocking on the waves of a hilly land? So again, I mean, there's a Similarly used over here, the tram cars are equated with ships uh, sailing out in wild seas. Uh, we are told there's a very interesting, a very close and cozy camaraderie between the uh, uh, the tram drivers and the tram conductors. So Annie is someone who's prescribed over here. Uh, she's a very vigilant, vigorous woman. Uh, it's impossible to escape her eyes and it's impossible to escape her attention. Uh, she takes the job very seriously and she's very good at it as well. Then also, in the easy hours of inspectors, uh, are most in evidence. For some reason, everybody employed in this tram service is young. There are no grey heads. It would not do. Therefore, the inspectors are of the right age. And one, the chief, is also good looking. See him stand on a wet, gloomy morning on his long oil skin, his peaked cap well down over his eyes, waiting to build a car. His face is ruddy, his small brown moustache is weathered. Uh, he has a faint, impudent smile, fairly tall and agile. Even in his waterproof, he springs aboard a car and greets Annie. So this is a tram inspector who comes in periodically uh, to check the condition of the uh, transport and then and obviously he's meeting Annie, the tram conductor. Hello Annie, uh, keeping the wet out, trying to. There are only two people in the car, inspecting us soon over, and then for a long and impudent chat on the footboard, a good easy 12-mile uh, chat. So, you know, we, we're given descriptions of different uh, times of the day, different days of the week, uh, and how uh, the, the, the quality, the, the color inside the tram car, the condition in the tram car is very periodical in quality, uh, very episodic in quality. So sometimes, certain times of the day, it's very packed with people, whereas certain times of the day, it's uh, relatively more free, relatively more thin, relatively more, more relaxed in quality. The inspector's name is John Joseph Rayner always called John Joseph. His face sets in a furry when he's addressed from a distance uh, with his abbreviation. There is considerable scandal about John Joseph in half a dozen villages. He flirts with the girl conductors in the morning and walks out with them in the dark night when they leave the tram car at the depot. Of course, the girls quit the service frequently. Then he flirts and walks out with a newcomer, always providing that she is sufficiently attractive uh, and that she will consent to walk. It is remarkable, however, that most of the girls are quite comely. They are all young, and this roving life aboard the car gives them a sailor's dash and recklessness. What matter how they behave when the ship is in port? Tomorrow, they'll be aboard again. Now, this is a point in the story where I just make a little digression 
and uh, uh, locate the story in the context of the times because what we are told at this point and what we'll see uh, in due course is that there is a man uh, who obviously enjoys a position of privilege in this professional um, circuit. Uh, it's called John Joseph, and he's a bit of a sexual predator, we are told. There's a scandal about him, so he's, he flirts with many women, uh, especially the newcomers uh, who join this particular service. Um, he's often seen with them in the evening, he's often seen with them at night, they often leave the house at night. Um, uh, quite frequently, these women leave the jobs after they have an affair with him, uh, presumably because of biological reasons we're not told, it's not spelled out to us. But you know, he is someone who keeps exploiting, keeps abusing his position in his professional, uh, in a professional paradigm, and that is something that we are obviously in the world we live in today. Uh, we we are getting more and more uh, knowledge about this kind of uh, behavior. We are getting more and more uh, uh, resentful uh, against this kind of behavior. Quite rightly so. There are campaigns, there are movements uh, of dignity in the workplace. Uh, the campaigns and movements of equality in the workplace. Of you know, no harassment. A situation in the workplace, etc. But this is a story which uh, is about, uh, in, among many things, is about harassment, uh, is about uh, you know being a victim to a, a predator-like uh, you know activity, especially from a person who occupies and enjoys a position of power, a position of privilege in that professional circuit. So uh, this is a very telling and very disturbing story about um, you know, harassment and, and a sexual nature. And you know the reason why I've chosen this. Uh, for this particular cause, is that it talks about, you know, very interestingly, it talks about agency and agency lessness and helplessness, especially in women when they are, you know, uh, exploited by someone in a position of power and superior in power. But what's interesting to know is that we are also told at the beginning of the story that these are women who are very vigilant, very vigorous, uh, they're very, very um, fierce about the jobs when they're inside the tram car, that when they get out of the tram car, uh, they become uh, quite easily exploited, especially by this particular person uh, who flirts with them, has affairs with them on numerous occasions, and then uh, you know he's someone who keeps abusing his position. Annie, however, was something of a tartar, and a sharp tongue had kept John Joseph at arm's length for many months. So John Joseph, being the predator that he is, is trying to woo Annie, is trying to flirt with Annie, but Annie is obviously more confident. He's more, she's more. Um, mm, strong uh, in what she does and so she she's managed to keep John Joseph at bay uh, for a period of time. Perhaps therefore she liked him all the more for he always came out smiling with impudence. She watched him vanquish one girl then another as she would tell by the movement of his mouth and eyes when she flirted when he flirted with her in the morning that he had been walking out with this lass or with the other the night before. Uh, she could sum him up pretty well. So Annie could see through John Joseph. Annie could see through the, the machinations of John Joseph. Uh, she knew perfectly well that he's a predator. Uh, he's a sexual predator. Uh, he's a professional predator. Uh, and you know, uh, he's someone who is dangerous and, and perhaps evil as well. But at the same time, she had a, a liking for him, perhaps because uh, she, she could see through him quite clearly, perhaps because she could figure him out quite clearly. So she could see through his um, in the politeness, his performance, etc. So she could sum him up pretty well. In their subtle antagonism, they knew each other like old friends. They were as shrewd with each other, one another, almost as man and wife. But Annie had always kept him fully at arm's length. Besides, she had a boy of her own. So she had a boyfriend of her own, and, and she wasn't very keen of having any kind of relationship with John Joseph. So that's something that we are told at the beginning of the story. The Statutes Fair, however, came in November at Middleton. So we talk about a, we we told about a fair, which is presumably a big thing, a big business activity. And obviously, with such a fair, the tram cars have become very busy with different kind of merchants and merchandise, and people going to the fair to buy things. So it's a busy time for these people as well. In November at Middleton, it happened that Annie uh, had a Monday night off. It was a drizzling, ugly night. Yet she dressed herself up and went to the fair ground. She was alone, but she, but she expected soon to find a pal of some sort. So she went to the fair, she visited the fair all by herself, uh, hoping and expecting to find a friend in the fair. The roundabouts were veering round and grinding out their music. The side shows were marking, making as much commotion as possible. In the coconut uh, shies, there were no coconuts but artificial substitutes, which the lads declared were fastened into the irons. 
there was a sad decline in the brilliance and luxury. Nonetheless, the, the ground was muddy as ever. There was the same crush, the press of faces lighted up by the flares and the electric lights, the same smell of naphtha and fried potatoes and electricity. So again, look at the very, very sensory quality of the description that Lawrence delivers over here. So he's talking about a fair, but we get the sense of sight and smell and the smell of naphtha, fried potatoes, electricity, the, the, the sides of different electric lights, the, the, the tactile quality of the fair as well is described to us. So it's very, very sensory, very heightened in quality in terms of the sensory level. Who would be the first to meet, to greet Miss Annie on the uh, showground but John Joseph. So John Joseph happened to be there as well and he r runs into Annie and they, he, they, they greet each other, he greets her. He had a black overcoat buttoned up to his chin and a tweed cap pulled down over his brows. His face between was ruddy and smiling and hearty as ever. She knew so well the way his mouth moved. So, you know, as we, ha we are told already, but you know, she can figure out um, her different signs, his different signs, his different amorous uh, signs and indications quite well. So she knew so well the way his mouth moved. She was very glad to have a boy. Uh, to be at the statues without a fellow was no fun. So, you know, she thought this was going to be at least some companion, uh, which could be potentially a good time. So she was glad that he, she met someone that she knew, John Joseph. Instantly, though the gallant he was, he took her on the dragon's grim to the roundabout switch, switchbacks. It was not, so, not nearly so exciting as a tram car, actually, but then to be seated in, the, in, in a shaking green dragon, uplifted by the sea of bubble faces, careering in the rickety fashion in the lower heavens, uh, whilst John Joseph leaned over her, his cigarette uh, in his mouth, was after all the right style. Uh, she was a plump, quick, um, alive little creature, so she was quite excited and happy. So we're having a description of physical proximity over here. John Joseph, being a very gallant predator, uh, you know, takes her on a different fun rides which are there in the fair. So she finds herself seated beside him uh, in this um, swinging dragon-like thing which takes her up in the sky, etc. And then John Joseph obviously is sitting right beside her with a cigarette in his mouth. Uh, and then she feels happy with the whole thing. And she thinks this is probably a good thing to do since she's an affair already. You know, and she was quite excited and happy. John Joseph made her stay on for the next round. And therefore, she, she could hardly, uh, for shame, to repulse him when he put his arm around her and drew her a little nearer to him. So, you know, obviously, he's becoming uh, the predator that he is. Uh, so he's drawing um, her towards himself, he put his arms around her, and then she doesn't say much because, you know, he's essentially paying uh, for the next ride, the next round. So we can see uh, the erotic quality in the writing uh, uh, that creeps in, uh, in Lawrence's narratives, because what is being said to us is the erotic tension that is being, you know, notched up by these descriptions uh, in, a, in a public fairground. Uh, and as I mentioned, this is a very topical story, it's a very important story for us today because it gives us a very disturbing image, a very disturbing description of uh, you know, sexual exploitation in a workplace and how that extends into outside the workplace as well. How the woman uh, can't say no at the beginning, but then you know, the whole idea of uh, being reluctant doesn't really matter because a man over here seems to have power, position, and obviously the money uh, you know, to buy rights for her. So it becomes a very disturbing uh, depiction uh, especially in relevance um, uh, in the world we live in today, the kind of news we consume today about this kind of uh, disgusting behavior. Okay, uh, so in a very, uh, she, she, he put his arms around her in a very warm and cuddly manner. Besides, he was fairly discreet. Uh, he kept his movement as hidden as possible. She looked down and saw that his red, clean hands was out of sight of the crowd, and they knew each other so well, so they warmed up to the fair. So she was uh, uncomfortable, perhaps, but then she didn't spell it out because she thought this is a fair. And then, you know, uh, she thought that they know each other, so she went on with it. After the dragons went on to the horses, John Joseph paid each time. So again, this is important because he's paying each time. So with each payment, uh, he seems to have a license to get sexual proximity to her. And that becomes a very complicated, disturbing mechanism of proximity, a very disturbing mechanism of, uh, uh, you know, predator behavior. She could but be uh, complacent. Uh, he, of course, sat astride uh, on the outer horse named Black Bess, uh, and she sat sideways towards him on the inner horse named Wildfire. 
But of course, John Joseph was not going to sit discreetly on black bears holding a brass, holding the brass bar. Round the spun and heaved um, in the light, and round it swung on his wooden seed, uh, steed, wooden horse, uh, flinging one leg across a mount, and perilously tipping up and down across the space, half lying back, laughing at her. He was perfectly happy. She was afraid. Um, her hat was on one side, but she was excited. So, you know, they, they're getting more excited. And again, what is interesting over here is you see the different machines in the fair, which become uh, sub symbols of some kind of erotic adventure. So both of them are riding horses, wooden horses, side by side. But this man who is paying for all his rides uh, gets more and more close to her, uh, puts his foot on her horse, and then, you know, moves sideways and bends in different directions. Uh, and the whole thing becomes a spectacle of excitement. She threw quartz on the table and won her two large pale blue hatpins. And then hearing the noise of the cinema announcing another performance, they climbed the birds and went in. So, you know, the film shows, the cinema shows, fairground rides, etc. They always become spectacles of, you know, merriment. And this merriment, interestingly, becomes uh, a danger zone as well very, very quickly, as we'll find out in due course of the narrative. Of course, during these performances, pitch darkness falls from time to time when the machine goes wrong. And there was some, there's a wild whooping and a loud smacking of simulated kisses. In these moments, John Joseph drew Annie towards him. After all, he had a wonderfully warm, cozy way of holding a girl with his arm. He seemed to make such a nice fit. And after all, it was a pleasant to be so, to be so held, uh, so very comforting and cozy and, and nice. He leaned over her and she felt his breath on her hair. She knew he wanted to kiss her on the lips and after all, he was so warm and, and she fitted him so softly. After all, she wanted him to touch his lips. But the light sprang up. So she also started electrically and put her hat straight. He left his arms lying nonchalant beside her, where it was fun, it was exciting to be at the statues with John Joseph. So, you know, she, the, the character Annie away is getting more and more seduced by the machines, by the merriment, by the proximity to John Joseph. And uh, obviously the seduction is dangerous in quality as we see. We, we know already about the character being a predator of the highest order. So this becomes, uh, and again, look at the way in which uh, Lawrence's stories have uh, this very interesting mixture of fun and darkness, uh, of excitement, adventure, and sort of deep, dark, and evil quality to it as well. So they sort of come together in a very asymmetric way, which makes his writing very complex, very human in quality. When the cinema was over, they went for a walk across the dark, damp fields. He had all the art, arts of lovemaking. He was especially good at holding a girl when he sat with her on a stile in the back, drizzling darkness. He seemed to be holding her in space against his own warmth and gratification, and his kisses are soft and slow and searching. So we have a very sensory description of lovemaking uh, over here. So Annie walked out with John Joseph, though she kept her own boy dangling in the distance. So, you know, walking out becomes a metaphor away uh, for perhaps a, a sexual relationship, perhaps an erotic relationship. Uh, so when, you know, every time there's a discussion of someone walking out with someone means they presumably made love, they presumably partners uh, in love, etc. Right? And that becomes an important metaphor over here. And we also told that she kept her own boy dangling in the distance. So, you know, she had a boyfriend, as we are told, but then this kind of a relationship, the sudden spurt of excitement that she gets from Joe and Joseph, uh, makes her more vulnerable, makes up, sort of seduces her into this relationship. And before she knows it, she's into it in a very, uh, dangerous and, and complex way. Some of the charm girls chose to be huffy, but there you must take things as you find them in this life. There's no mistake about it, Annie liked John Joseph a good deal. She felt so pleasant and warm in herself wherever, whenever he was near. And John Joseph really liked Annie more than usual. The soft melting away in which she could flow into a fellow as if she had melted into his very bones was something rare and gratifying. He fully appreciated this. But with a developing acquaintance, there began a developing intimacy. Annie wanted to consider him as a person, a man. Uh, she wanted to take an intelligent interest in him and to have an intelligent response. She did not want to have a mere nocturnal presence, which was what he was so far. And she prided herself that she could not, he could not leave her. So this is an interesting bit in the story where uh, we find that from her perspective, this is a human relationship of, with human uh, emotions and a holistic human quality. Whereas from his perspective, this is more of a nocturnal adventure, more of a nighttime adventure, a nighttime predatory activity. So we have this uh, sort of deep, dark rings uh, coming in already. 
And then obviously with her, with Annie, uh, she's beginning to develop a generating economy of expectations uh, where she tells herself that you know, John Joseph cannot leave her because you know, he's now uh, emotionally entangled with her. And that's at least what she would like to believe. Here she made a mistake, and this is what we find out uh, immediately. Here she made a mistake. John Joseph intended to remain a nocturnal presence. So for John Joseph, this was just a nighttime activity, a nighttime amorous activity, and, and little more. He had no idea of becoming an all-round individual to her. So his idea of being an all-round human being and being a predator is something which constantly comes in this tension, constantly comes in the story. And this is why we find the story is so relevant for us today, especially in the kind of movements you see around us, is, you know, the voices of women speaking out for the first time, uh, being harassed and, 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 and exploited in workplaces and different conditions. Uh, so in that kind of a setting, this story becomes a very, very important uh, work of fiction. When she started to take an intelligent interest in him and his life and his character, he sheared off. He hated individual intelligent interests. He knew that the only way to stop it was to avoid it. The possessive female was aroused in Annie, so he left her. So, you know, this little sentence, so he left her, becomes uh, interesting. It has a sort of clinical quality to it. He left her, he departed, so the whole thing was over for her. It was just a merriment for him, and that's something which, is, which comes to an abrupt end. Right, so we stop at this point today in the story, but we begin to see the dark tones coming in, uh, the dark and moral tones coming in, how sexuality becomes uh, exciting, a positive activity, as well as a very negative dark activity. And that's something that tension keeps running in Lawrence's fiction. Uh, we find this story is very interesting, especially as I keep mentioning from a feminist perspective, uh, of how you know, this woman, this vulnerable woman, navigates with this sexual predator. Uh, this man who possesses power in professional circuit, who possesses power economically, sexually, and how does she navigate with him? Uh, how does she you know, address him? How does she become a prey to him? Uh, and how does she avenge herself in the end? That's what we find out uh, as we read the story. So we'll stop at this point today, and we'll continue with the story in the next lectures. Thank you for your attention.